Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Stephen Kirshner. Stephen is the Program Director for Trade and Investment at the United States Center at the University of Sydney. Stephen has written widely on financial markets and economic policy in Australia and joined us today to discuss the amazing journey of monetary policy in Australia through the last few decades. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, David. Well, it's great to have you on. We've interacted online a lot, and uh, you yourself have written on nominal GDP targeting, and you have, have a lot of interesting work. We're going to cover some of that today. We're going to spend our time thinking about and trying to grapple with what Australia has done that has led to such an amazing journey over these past few decades. Now, Australia, like most countries, has succumbed to the COVID-19 shock, and I believe this is the first recession in a number of years. Is that right? Yes, it'll be the first recession really since the early 1990s. Yeah, so that's an amazing run. And on top of that, Australia fared the Great Recession relatively well. Um, some attributed to luck, some attributed to, to better policy, and we'll come back to that question later. Um, another fascinating fact about Australia is that it's run current account deficits for a long, long time as well. And you often you know, warn against doing that, and yet Australia has, has fared relatively well. So it, Australia has a lot of interesting features about it. You know, It's been relatively recession-proof, at least until recently. The Central Bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the RBA, has done relatively well. It was one of the early adopters of inflation targeting. Just a lot of interesting features, and we'll try to get to as much as we can during this show. Before we do that, though, Stephen, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do there at the University of Sydney? I was always very interested in the intersection of politics and economics and studied both as an undergraduate at the Australian National University in the mid to late 1980s. Economics at ANU at the time had a very strong neoclassical orientation. It was sometimes called the Chicago of the South because it had a lot of Chicago-trained or or Chicago-influenced economists. The economics faculty there at the time were also very engaged with public policy in various ways, including through think tanks. And so that was a a very strong influence on me. My first class in Economics One was with Professor Ian Harper, who is now on the board of the Reserve Bank. Uh, The faculty also included people like Jeff Brennan, who was one of James Buchanan's co-authors. So I was fortunate enough to have Jeff uh, for Economics Two. After graduating, I worked as an advisor for two Liberal Party members of the Australian Federal Parliament, uh, the Liberal Party being the main Conservative Party in Australia, to put that uh, in American terms. And the Liberal Party took a supply-side reform package to the 1993 federal election, uh, which they lost. But part of that package was a proposal to put the Reserve Bank of Australia on a more independent footing and to give the bank uh, an inflation target. Uh, which is one of the things that got me interested in in monetary policy. Uh, That proposal was considered hugely controversial at the time and was strongly opposed by the then uh, governor of the bank, Bernie Fraser. Uh, So after the 1993 election, I did a master's degree in economics and subsequently worked in financial markets with Standard & Poor's Institutional Market Services. I was based in both Sydney and Singapore. And a large part of that job was central bank watching. Uh, in my case, the RBA, the RBNZ, uh, and the BOJ. I subsequently left financial markets in 2003 to do a PhD in economics, and since then I've mostly worked in academia and think tanks, although I also did a three-year stint as chief economist with the Australian Financial Markets Association, which is the peak industry body for market participants. Uh, And a large part of that role was dealing with the RBA on various regulatory issues. Uh, So since 2018, I've been at the U.S. Study Centre at the University of Sydney running the Trade and Investment Program. One of the things we are interested in is the determinants of investment in Australia and the U.S. and and cross-border investment between the two economies. And monetary policy obviously plays a large role in that, 
Uh, so most of my career has touched upon monetary policy from various perspectives. Yes, and again, Australia has a rich history and fascinating history. And it was interesting to hear you say that the, the RBA was initially opposed to the move to inflation targeting in the early 90s, because nowadays it's heralded as one of the early adopters, the pioneer, one of the pioneers, right? But it's fascinating that uh, it actually got resistance from the central bank itself. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. We'll talk about the history of inflation targeting in Australia. But I want to come back to this point that Australia has been relatively resilient to recessions that the rest of the world has gone through, at least what the U.S. has endured. So in 1990s was the last recession that it, it really endured. It missed the other two that followed, 2001, of course, the Great Recession, 2008. And I want to walk through the Great Recession or the Great Financial Crisis, 2007, 2009, and 2008 period there, and, and give us your account of what happened, because there's many stories told. I've, I've told the story that you know, in part due to monetary policy doing a good job, but there's also a luck story. Um, there's a commodity export story close, tied to China. A lot of moving parts there. So why don't you give us your take on what happened during the Great Recession, or re rephrase that, why wasn't there a Great Recession in Australia that we experienced in the rest of the world during that time? Yes, you often get the uh, impression offshore that discussion offshore often goes along the lines of, well, Australia hasn't had a recession since the early 1990s, and so we must have some secret source uh, or secret formula as to how we manage to avoid recession. And it's not uncommon for people to attribute that to monetary policy, uh, and I think monetary policy uh, is implicated, although not in the way that many people would think. Uh, it's certainly not the case that we've escaped the business cycle. I mean, we still have had uh, very serious downturns in the Australian economy since then. Uh, the 2008 crisis did lead to a downturn in Australia. We had a, a two percentage point increase in the unemployment rate during that episode. What we avoided, of course, was the conventional definition of a recession, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Uh, and I think policy certainly played a role there, both monetary and fiscal, in terms of uh, smoothing out the cycle such that we managed to avoid that somewhat arbitrary definition of a recession. Uh, but it's certainly the case that we uh, experienced a downturn. I think part of the success of the Australian economy since the early 1990s has been that many of the shocks that have hit the global economy uh, since then have been somewhat tangential to the Australian economy. Uh, it used to be the case up until the early 2000s that the Reserve Bank, for example, would model the Australian uh, economic growth rate in terms of a long-run equilibrium relationship with the United States. So if the United States turned down, we would uh, turn down as a matter of course. And that relationship really broke down from the early 2000s, particularly with the 2001 recession. And I think that was partly that the Australian economy was not that exposed to the ICT goods producing sector in the way that the US was. So we are a net consumer and importer of ICT rather than a, a net producer. When you say ICT, you mean information and communication technology? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the tech sector downturn in the US in 2001 was uh, not something that really impacted the, the production side of the Australian economy. And similarly with the crisis in 2008, the Australian financial system really had very little exposure to US mortgage-backed securities. It just wasn't a big part of their, their business models. And so we didn't have the fallout for the financial system in Australia that we had uh, in the United States. Uh, there were some financial institutions that uh, got into trouble uh, in Australia, but we didn't have the sort of route that we saw uh, in the US, UK, uh, and Europe. Uh, so, and of course, that brings us to today with the COVID pandemic. And of course, the COVID pandemic is a shock that we just couldn't avoid. Um, and so we will certainly experience a recession in the first half of this year. But in terms of macroeconomic policy and the contribution it made to uh, avoiding recession over this period. I don't think it's coincidental that we moved in the direction of inflation targeting from 
the early 1990s. So starting in 19, after the 1993 federal election, the RBA started to target inflation rate implicitly um, and then explicitly from 1996. And so this is the first time that monetary policy in Australia really had a, a firm uh, nominal anchor. So the RBA decided on a singular objective and pursued that objective with a singular policy instrument, which was the official cash rate. Uh, and I think that focus on inflation really for the first time in the RBA's, RBA's history certainly meant that uh, monetary policy was conducted in a way that was more stabilising than it had been before. So I think you can argue that uh, policy contributed in that sense. I don't think the RBA was doing anything that other central banks weren't doing. So its approach to inflation targeting was pretty conventional. It was not really that different from the approach being adopted in, in many other economies at the time. And the RBA was looking at this in a broadly New Keynesian, Taylor Rule type framework. So I think their thinking about monetary policy was very similar to uh, that of foreign central banks. But when you combine that with a macro environment in which the shocks that the world economy was experiencing uh, were somewhat tangential to the Australian economy, then I think the combination of those two things was a, a recipe for uh, a continuous expansion, at least in terms of not having two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Let me go back to that period a little bit. So some commentators, I think you're alluding to this, uh, mentioned the commodity prices going up in 2008 as one reason Australia didn't do as bad as the rest of the world. Now, you've gave, you gave other reasons. It wasn't as exposed to some of these financial derivatives. The run on the shadow banking system didn't hit Australia as hard or at all like it did in the U.S. But the commodity shock story has a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Commodity prices did eventually fall in 2009, but that, that story is often given as the good luck. They just got lucky. And I, I think if, if you want to make a luck story, this is a point you've, you've raised before, is that Australia went into the recession, into this crisis, with comparatively high inflation and nominal GDP growth. So it had more room to cut interest rates. It never hit the zero lower bound. Um, so maybe that's the luck story, is that it just came in with above-trend inflation. Um, is that a fair assessment? Commodity prices certainly play a role. The way I look at it is Australia experienced a huge terms of trade boom starting in 2003. And by 2008, the Australian economy was really running red hot. I mean, we had nominal GDP growth at an annual rate in double digits, uh, we had a CPI inflation rate running 5%. The unemployment rate hit 3.9%, which was the lowest since the early 1970s. And so we went into the financial crisis with a huge nominal and real buffer. Uh, and in fact, I think in some ways the uh, financial crisis did the RBA an enormous favour because it was in a situation in 2008 where in the absence of a global shock, uh, the Australian economy was running well above capacity and inflation was becoming unanchored. Um, inflation expectations were becoming unanchored as well. Uh, so the, the global shock kind of did some of the RBA's work for it in terms of uh, putting a break on what in many ways was a, a runaway economy at that time. Uh, so it was just a case of going into the crisis in a, in a hugely strong position, uh, which meant that they had a lot of room to uh, do things in terms of monetary policy. Uh, Australia also had a negative net debt position at the time. We were running very large budget surpluses. Uh, the Commonwealth government was accumulating assets uh, through a, a sovereign wealth fund. Uh, and so in terms of both monetary and fiscal policy, there was certainly a lot of firepower that they could bring to bear uh, in relation to the crisis. But they're also aided by the fact that the downturn uh, for Australia was really a function of what was happening offshore, it wasn't a, a matter of the Australian economy having systematic weaknesses. Yeah. Well, I just want to highlight, though, that Australia may not have been exposed to these you know, mortgage-backed securities, the CDOs, these financial derivatives. It did have, however, uh, 
highly leveraged households. I mean, compared to the U.S., a lot of household debt, high household prices, and kind of one of the standard stories told is that it was the housing sector that really gave rise to the crash in the U.S. economy. And I think Australia provides an interesting counterexample. I mean, again, they got lucky in the sense that they came into the crisis with lots of high nominal income growth, which means they can maintain, you know, nominal income growth is essential to paying those mortgages, meeting your financial obligations, higher inflation. And so uh, to me, again, a takeaway is they didn't hit the zero lower bound. They still had relatively decent nominal income growth through 2009 compared to other places who similarly had lots of household leverage. So household leverage was not a sufficient condition in Australia to generate a severe contraction. We certainly have had very pronounced cycles in house prices, uh, in many ways even more pronounced than the US. Uh, and this is just a function of uh, a very rigid supply side of the housing market combined with a, a demand side that can, can shift very quickly. So when demand changes, takes a while for supply to catch up and mm-hmm. um, to these very pronounced uh, cycles. Uh, it's certainly true that the household sector has been increasing its leverage uh, more or less continuously since deregulation of uh, financial markets in the early 1980s. Um, And I think in many ways the household sector has really just been uh, reaching for a new equilibrium in terms of its its, uh, balance sheet, so the mix of um, household debt and assets. Uh, You have to remember that before financial deregulation in the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of financial repression in the Australian financial system so mortgage interest rates, for example, were uh, subject to a price ceiling. We had uh, credit rationing. And so I think in many ways, households were prevented from borrowing as much as they would have liked. So as those constraints have come off, the household sector has increased its leverage. But I don't think that leverage has been a problem from a macroeconomic point of view. I think if you look historically at Australia, the, the two sectors that have got into trouble uh, in terms of leverage and overextending extending themselves have been either the, the corporate sector uh, or, or the government sector. Um, the household sector has not really been a source of macroeconomic stability in Australia historically. Uh, so in the late 1980s, for example, uh, the corporate sector overextended uh, in terms of leverage, uh, particularly in relation to commercial property. Uh, the government sector has overextended itself in terms of uh, running b- large budget deficits at various times in its history. Uh, but by comparison, I'd say the, the household sector has been uh, fairly prudent. Now, as the uh, household debt-to-income ratio has increased, uh, policymakers in Australia have become increasingly concerned with uh, whether the sector is taking on too much leverage. Uh, and that has seen financial stability concerns loom a little bit larger in terms of Uh, both monetary policy and and prudential policy. But it's hard to say to what extent this is a problem. Certainly, even within the RBA, they debate the question of whether or not this is an equilibrium phenomenon. So if equilibrium interest rates are falling, uh, we're doing less financial repression than we did historically, Uh, maybe this is an equilibrium phenomenon which policy should accommodate. But they're also wary of uh, some of the dangers of an over-leveraged household sector. I think part of this more recently has just been fighting the last war, that they're very conscious of what happened in the US and, and don't sure. want to repeat that experience here. But I think part of what happened in the US was just a very fragmented you know, regulatory system. Um, a lot of things fell between the regulatory cracks, uh, which has not happened so much in Australia because we have a sort of more unified and coherent uh, system of financial regulation. But going back to your your point about housing, there was some correction in two thousand eight, what you you noted, but it didn't lead to the massive contraction we had in the U.S. In other words, both both economies had highly leveraged households, both economies had cities with really roaring housing prices, rapid growth, um, both economies had a correction in housing but only one experienced a great recession, right? And so I, I guess one of the takeaways I, I get out of Australia is that that housing, highly leveraged households is by itself not a sufficient condition for a sharp recession. There's got to be some other pieces of the puzzle you got to put on there. Now, 
I, I think in the case of the U.S., two big differences. One is the run on the shadow banking system definitely exacerbated matters, and you already alluded to and mentioned that that wasn't the case there. Second thing is just the lack of policy space that Australia had to work with. So again, there's some luck there. there there's also just you know different dynamics at play. But I think that's an important lesson for us to, to, to consider. And I, I know we're in a very different crisis today, <laughs> different things that we, we look at. But let's do this. Let's move on to the structure, the the design, the differences in the RBA versus the Fed. Because here in the U.S., you know, the Federal Reserve is well known. Most of my listeners are in the United States. I know there's a number around the world. I mean, you're in Australia, for example. I know you listen, and people in Europe have told me they listen in Canada and other places. But I, I suspect many of the listeners aren't as familiar with the structure of the Reserve Bank of Australia. So maybe you can like walk us through the mandates maybe the governance, and, and maybe the history of its inflation target. Sure. So the statute for the Reserve Bank of Australia is a 1959 uh, piece of legislation. And the legislation gives the RBA a mandate that has three components to it. Uh, so the first component is the stability of the currency, which is conventionally being read as a price stability mandate. Uh, the second element is a, a full employment mandate. And the third element is this sort of open-ended uh, promote the welfare of people, the people of Australia mandate. And it's the third element of the mandate which uh, sometimes uh, causes uh, people to, to puzzle. So you have to remember that when the Reserve Bank Act was written uh, in the late 1950s and it reflected uh, previous legislation uh, for its predecessor institution, uh, when that legislation was written, price stability and full employment were seen to be a much greater tension than we would accept today. Uh, so this is pre-rational expectations uh, revolution. Uh, and so in giving the RBA a price stability and full employment mandate, there was debate as to how you would reconcile uh, those two things. And if you look at the biography of H.C. Coombs, who was the first governor of the Reserve Bank in, uh, from 1960, uh, he said that the, the third element of the mandate to promote the welfare of the people of Australia was really just an attempt to fudge uh, or reconcile the first two. So I think one, one way of interpreting this would be to say, however you manage the trade-off between price stability and full employment, do it in a way that's wealthy maximizing. So the RBA had a dual mandate back in the 60s. I mean, starting in 1959. Yeah, the RBA has always uh, been seen to have a, a dual mandate for price stability and full employment. Uh, but more recently, the, the third element of the mandate has been used by the current governor, Governor Lowe, to infer a statutory basis for a financial stability mandate. Because Governor Lowe would argue that to the extent that financial stability potentially poses a threat to the welfare of the people of Australia, then you can read into that third element of the mandate a, a financial stability mandate. And I think the problem here, of course, is that you can um, read almost anything into the objective of promoting the welfare of the people of Australia. Uh, so potentially this becomes a way in which you could smuggle additional objectives into the statutory mandate for the bank. How has the RBA fulfilled those mandates historically? So has it lived up to the dual mandate? Has it, has it done a good job balancing the two? <laughs> Well, you have to recall that up until 1983, the Reserve Bank, uh, well, uh, Australia had a floating exchange, uh, fixed exchange rate regime. Uh, so we didn't really have an independent monetary policy okay. before 1983. We had various types of fixed or managed exchange rate regime, uh, either to the British pound or, or to the US dollar. Uh, and that had exactly the consequences that Milton Friedman predicted that it would have, which was that the exchange rate became the tail that wagged the dog of the economy. Uh, and for a small open economy like Australia, it was very much a suboptimal uh, regime. Uh, prior to 1982, it was also the case that the central bank uh, would sometimes finance the 
federal government's uh, budget if it was running a deficit. So the central uh, the government would borrow directly from the central bank. So before 1983, you had a fixed exchange rate or a managed exchange rate uh, and a central bank that was accommodating fiscal policy a lot of the time. Uh, so we didn't really have an independent uh, monetary policy. You could argue that the price level was effectively being determined by um, fiscal policy and the occasional uh, change in the exchange rate regime. Um, so in many ways, this looked like uh, the sort of the world that the MMT people advocate because you had oh, that's interesting. monetary financing of the, the budget uh, deficit and you had extensive wage and price controls in an effort to try and manage the inflationary consequences of that. Did it work out all right? So it's really only after 1983 that the Reserve Bank really gains control of the monetary policy. Uh, and for most of the 1980s, the Reserve Bank was really wrestling with uh, the pursuit of a number of different uh, macroeconomic objectives simultaneously uh, and using a, a number of different operating instruments as well. So for much of the 80s, there was a focus on uh, quantitative uh, policy instruments, mostly restrictions on, on bank lending uh, and credit formation. In the late 1980s, we had what was called the checklist, which was basically a laundry list of macroeconomic objectives that the RBA was notionally trying to target. Uh, but it was a classic case of you know, too many policy objectives being pursued with too many policy instruments. And so it's really only in the early 1990s when the RBA moves in the direction of inflation targeting that it has firstly a, a clear objective uh, for policy. And in 1990, it started announcing uh, changes to the official cash rate as its main operating instrument. And so we finally had uh, a, a single policy objective and a single policy instrument with which to pursue that objective. And that's where monetary policy comes into its own. Okay. Now, my understanding is that the inflation rate has been below target since 2014, 2015. Is that right? Yeah, since the end of 2014. Yes, it's been persistently under target, which is very similar to what we've had in the U.S. up until the crisis and, and still do today. I mean, but obviously the current crisis is a different story. But uh, the RBA was facing the same struggle that the Federal Reserve was facing, that the ECB was facing, Bank of Japan. Inflation was was undershooting persistently its, its target during that time. And uh, you discuss how they were very they they were telling very similar stories. RBA officials were telling similar stories to the Fed officials that one off you know shocks from this sector, from this development, supply side distortions, a number of, of non monetary stories. So walk us through that and, and tell us what you think really happened. Why did the RBA fail to hit its inflation target from that period on? We should probably say a little bit about how the RBA formulates and, and thinks about its inflation target, at least historically. Uh, so since 1993, the RBA has talked about inflation targeting in terms of uh, inflation averaging between 2 and 3% uh, over time, and the the over time bit is um, sort of the ambiguous uh, element of this. Um, but the way the RBA would define success in terms of its inflation targeting regime would be to say, if over a significant period of time, and we're probably talking anywhere from five to ten years, the inflation rate were to average two point something, then they would deem that to be hitting the inflation target. Uh, so it's a medium-term flexible inflation target. It's expressed that way because it's designed to accommodate uh, things like supply shocks. So an overshooting or an undershooting of the central tendency of the inflation target uh, due to a supply shock is something that the RBA would look through. So treat that as a temporary deviation, not something that policy has to immediately respond to. Uh, as long as the central tendency for inflation is around about 2.5, uh, then that would be considered to be a success in terms of the inflation targeting regime. So you can think of it as, as average uh, inflation targeting. 
So if you look at the RBA under Governor McFarlane from 1996 through to 2006 and then under Governor uh, Stevens from uh, 2006 to 2016, uh, if you look at the average inflation rate under both those governors, it is bang on 2.5%. Wow. So the RBA did exactly what it said it would do, uh, which is target the central tendency of that 2 to 3%. Uh, range. So more recently, the RBA, as you've noted, has uh, been undershooting its inflation target. So inflation fall, falls below target at the end of 2014 and has been either below target or at the very bottom of the range more or less continuously since then, so going on six years. Uh, so this is really stretching the, the overtime part of the uh, RBA's agreement with the government on inflation. Uh, if we look at the RBA's forecast, their forecast horizon goes out two years. They're expected to continue to undershoot over the next couple of years. So you're really looking at an eight-year uh, undershoot of the inflation target. And I would argue that there's two elements to this undershooting. Uh, the first is a policy mistake, uh, and that policy mistake was exactly the mistake that the Fed made in the US, which is that the RBA underestimated. Uh, the Nehru. Uh, so just as the US Fed was reluctant to ease monetary policy for fear that a falling unemployment rate would lead to uh, a takeoff in inflation, the RBA has not had much the same concern. And they've only very recently uh, in the last uh, year or so conceded that the Nehru is actually a lot lower than they previously thought. So they had been thinking of the Nehru as sitting at an unemployment rate of around 5%. And the unemployment rate has been very close to 5%, at least before the pandemic. So before the pandemic hit the last previous year or two, the RBA thought, well, if inflation's down around 5%, then if the unemployment rate's down around 5%, then the inflation rate will have to take off. And they're being sort of sitting on their hands waiting for that to happen. Of course, it didn't, didn't occur. And so this led them to revise the Nehru down to four and a half. Uh, the other element was not a policy mistake, but a policy choice. Um, when Governor Lowe uh, assumed office in 2016, he got the government to agree to changes to the statement on the conduct of monetary policy that really defines how the RBA goes about inflation targeting. Previous statements on monetary policy up until 2010, had not contained any references to financial stability concerns. Uh, with the 2010 agreement after the financial crisis, there was a, a new section added uh, discussing financial stability. That section made the financial stability objective explicitly subordinate to price stability. So the relevant section reads, without compromising the price stability objective, the RBA should reference financial stability concerns in its conduct of policy. The 2016 agreement, uh, when Phil Lowe became uh, governor, kind of inverted that relationship. So it explicitly allowed for short-term deviations from the inflation target in pursuit of other objectives. And the only other objective that was explicitly mentioned was financial stability. So now the agreement was effectively giving the RBA a license to miss the inflation target uh, if it had financial stability concerns, which under Governor Lowe uh, it has. So since uh, Philip Lowe became governor, the RBA has started to very explicitly trade off the inflation target and the full employment mandate against these financial stability concerns. And so for the first few years in which uh, Philip Lowe was governor, uh, there was no change in monetary policy. There was uh, an assumption that uh, inflation would take off because the unemployment rate was low. Um, this didn't happen. Uh, so inflation, inflation expectations both declined. Um, but the RBO was very reluctant to ease monetary policy because it was concerned that this would lead to an acceleration 
uh, in uh, household leverage uh, and strength in the, in the housing market. And so the Reserve Bank very explicitly uh, let the inflation target go in pursuit of these financial stability concerns. So the new governor erred on the side of the financial stability mandate over the inflation target part of the mandate. Put, he put more weight on financial stability. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, he, he okay. did this exactly. Um, so there are various statements which I um, quote in uh, my paper in Economic Analysis and Policy where the RBA, in explaining its policy decisions, says, yes, we could have higher inflation and stronger economic growth if we were to ease policy, but we're worried about what's happening in terms so of... So they were explicit about it. They're like, look, we are going to yeah. err on the side of reining in our concerns about financial instabilities that are emerging in the economy at the expense of inflation. So in my mind, that puts the cart in front of the horse. I think you alluded to this in your paper, but if you want to... One of the conditions to maintaining financial stability is to maintain stable nominal income growth, right? You've got to pay the bills on all these existing financial contracts, the mortgages, the loans. And if inflation continues to drop, it implies a drop in nominal income growth as well. In fact, you know, I've looked at, um, as you know, measures of nominal income in Australia, and it, it, it fared relatively well through the Great Recession. It took a little bit of a, a, a downturn, but Overall, it was relatively stable up until about this same period. You see nominal income or nominal GDP beginning to fall below um, its trend path. So m my concern is you, you focus so much on financial stability, you, you, you lose sight of the fact you want to maintain stable income growth as well. Um, but the other observation I have from this is it, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that Governor Lowe is, is showing us what a central bank that implements the BIS vision of the world would look like, right? So the BIS for years has been preaching financial stability, financial stability, financial stability. And we finally have a central bank that has implemented that, who's, who's worried more about financial stability than the other part of the mandate. And this is one potential outcome we get from it. Yes, Governor Lowe certainly spent time at the BIS. I mean, that's not unusual for uh, a career RBA officer to do a stint uh, at the BIS. Uh, but I think he certainly drank too much of whatever it is they put in the water at the BIS, such that he became very preoccupied with um, financial stability issues. And that interest of his really predates the financial crisis. So he was writing about this um, back in the early 1990s. Um, so it's a concern that he has that predates the financial crisis. I think he would see the financial crisis as essentially you know, validating uh, that concern. But I think in, in many ways, Governor Lowe is a, a break or a discontinuity in the approach that uh, previous governors have, have taken to monetary policy, I think. Uh, his predecessors, E.E. McFarlane and Glenn Stevens, were, were very pragmatic in their approach. Uh, they weren't particularly model-driven. I think their approach was to uh, take the price and uh, full employment mandates, look out the window, see what's happening with the economy, uh, and respond uh, to that. And, and that was a very effective approach. Philip Lowe, I think, is on the side of worrying too much about apprehended financial stability risks. So if you read the RBA's financial stability reports, for example, they would say, well, uh, the financial system's in good shape, risks are low, and we want to keep them that way. Uh, well, if that's the case, if financial stability risks uh, are, in fact, uh, well-contained and well-managed, uh, why do you want to sacrifice your inflation target and full employment objectives uh, responding to what is essentially an apprehended uh, concern. In many ways, it involves the central bank second-guessing capitalist stacks between consenting adults. I mean, implicitly, you're saying there must be some sort of market failure in the decisions of households in relation to um, their balance sheets. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of evidence of that. Uh, the Reserve Bank in its financial stability reports doesn't present any evidence uh, for that point of view. I think the best you can say for it is, well, 
if a law wants to run lunch policy in such a way that these risks do not emerge, but involves incurring a real cost right. for a, a questionable benefit. Yeah, to be clear, financial stability is is an issue. You want to keep an eye on it, but you don't want to emphasize it so much that you jeopardize growth in the real economy. And 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 we have examples of this, right? We have many historical examples. I mean, one that you've covered in your work is the case of uh, Sweden, right, where they were really concerned about home prices to the extent they tightened policy. Was it 2011 they did this? Was this the period where they? Yeah. Yeah. So Lars Finsson was there. He was a, one of the members of the. Uh, central bank. So they, they sacrificed the real economy. I would say they sacrificed nominal income growth um, at the altar of financial stability. So there's a balance you need to draw there. But if, if you're going to come out and explicitly say, we're willing to let inflation deviate from its target to hit a financial objective, you, I think you're, you're, you are putting again, the cart before the horse there. I mean, you want to maintain financial obligations that have been agreed to, and, and obligations of businesses and households that can only be met by income growth. So where does that stand now? I mean, any soul searching going on at the RBA about this? Any, any like look backs, hey, maybe we erred too much on the financial stability mandate? Yeah, you know, I think Lars Svensson has a very good framework for thinking about these issues, which partly reflects his experience as deputy governor of the Swedish Central Bank. Uh, and he was a, a dissenter from the approach that the Swedish Central Bank uh, took at the time. And subsequent to that experience, has developed formal models for thinking about uh, the relationship between financial stability and other parts of the, the Central Bank's mandate. And I think Lars presents a very straightforward cost-benefit framework for analysing this issue, which is to say, uh, what do you gain in terms of financial stability from a policy approach of leaning against the wind. Uh, so in other words, trading off your inflation target and full employment mandates against financial stability concerns. And his argument is that under any reasonable parameterization of the problem, uh, the gain in terms of financial stability is just not worth the cost in terms of foregone um, output and inflation below target. And in particular, I think you would argue in a way that's consistent with your own research, David, uh, is that if you're running monetary policy that's too tight, well, yes, it might limit growth uh, in debt, um, but it also limits growth in incomes. So you're hitting both the numerator and the denominator of the debt-to-income ratio. So his argument would be there's very little gain in terms of uh, widely used financial stability metrics like debt-to-income ratios uh, for the cost incurred. So that work has been replicated uh, within the Reserve Bank. So there was a research discussion paper by Peter Tulip and Trent Saunders um, looked at uh, Australian monetary policy in terms of Lars Svensson's framework. Uh, that paper was very interesting in that the Reserve Bank sat on that paper for about 12 months, uh, if not longer, uh, I think because it was concerned that it would paint current policy settings in a Really? Um, That's fascinating. Um, and when they released the paper, they released it alongside uh, another paper on um, household debt, which was uh, clearly designed to divert attention from it. So they are a little bit touchy on this issue. Um, I think certainly within the bank, a lot of people question the approach of the, the current governor. I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with his approach precisely because they see it as a departure from... Uh, previous practice. The fact is the government has effectively given the RBA a licence to do it in terms of the changes that were made to the Statement on the Conduct of Monetary Policy in 2016. Interestingly, after the last federal election, uh, typically there's when there's a change of government or a change in governor, you will revisit the statement uh, and uh, either reaffirm it uh, uh, or change it. Uh, it took them, there was a lot of back and forth between the government and the RBA this time uh, on, the, on the statement. We don't know exactly what the nature of that back and forth was. This was all behind closed doors. But it took a very long time for the government to um, agree to reaffirm the 2016 statement. And I think that reflected the government's concern that the RBA was not fulfilling the inflation part of its mandate. 
And there was speculation that they were thinking of toughening the accountability measures around the inflation target. For example, requiring the, the governor to write a letter to the treasurer, for example, to explain why uh, they had undershot the inflation target would be one such mechanism that was supposedly considered. Uh, in the end, the government just reaffirmed the 2016 statement. And so whatever the nature of that discussion was, I think the, the Reserve Bank uh, won that discussion. But uh, I think it does reflect a level of disquiet in government circles as the RBA underperforming against its mandate. Uh, and I think the RBA will need to be very careful going forward that it doesn't actually delegitimise uh, not only the inflation target but the monetary policy itself. Because the RBA has been undershooting its inflation target for so long, people are now questioning whether the RBA can hit it. Uh, people have been calling for an, the abandonment of inflation targeting um, or, or lowering the inflation target uh, because there are some people who interpret the undershoot as uh, an inability of the bank to hit the target as opposed to a deliberate policy choice. Yes, it reminds me of the Fed being bewildered by its inability to hit its inflation target while ignoring the fact that it raised interest rates nine times between 2015 and 2019. You know, there are policy choices that could have been done very differently. L let me ask this, though, about the RBA I was reading your description of it, the actual governance. There are nine, it has a nine member board where you have the governor, you got a deputy governor, you got the secretary of the treasury, which is a little surprising. But you also have six part time external members, including a number drawn from the labor movement. So you actually have labor movement representatives on the board of a central bank, which is really interesting. And I would think that that would minimize groupthink or, or bring in some additional insights from the, you know from outsiders who don't necessarily view financial stability as the final goal has that been manifested do we see the labor representatives the the, the more diverse you know views at the board play a role in the decision making well of the six part-time external members of the board uh, one is typically an economist which is exactly what you'd want on a, a board that is there to set monetary policy. Uh, the others have typically been either business people and uh, often in the past a representative of the labour movement. That practice has sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit. Oh, okay. So there aren't that many labour on the board? No, no. So historically, uh, Labour Party governments have often appointed someone from the trade union movement uh, to the board. and. The motivation for that was partly to ensure that labour as well as business were represented uh, in the monetary policy. I mean, I think the, the RBA would defend the current board uh, structure on, along similar lines to the ones you suggest, which is um, they argue that having business people uh, on the board who aren't necessarily monetary policy experts uh, gives them greater insight into what's happening in the real economy. But the fact is the Reserve Bank has a very extensive business liaison program through which they get feedback from the business community that's much broader and uh, deeper than they would get from the members of the board. So it's not really in, they can get as much feedback from the business community as they want um, without having to have business people uh, sitting on the but board. But the board itself isn't that diverse, I guess, is my question. You, you want to avoid group think. So one of the critiques of, you know, a ECB, maybe the, the Fed, is you get a bunch of economists together and they all you know, live in their ivory towers and aren't really exposed to different train of thought, I guess. Is, is that a problem with the RBA, do you think, or do they get past it with this, at least on paper, a more diverse board? Well, I think we have the opposite problem that apart from the economist, uh, part-time external board member, uh, the other members of the board are not sufficiently trained or equipped to interrogate the recommendation of the oh i see and so so this is a problem i think that um, so they just, they just kind of rubber stamp the decision <laughs> because they don't know yeah, any better yeah. okay well let yeah, me i think in, in, go ahead in practice in practice the board has tended to be uh, a rubber stamp for the recommendation put to it by the bank uh, and so you don't really get around the groupthink problem if indeed you have a, a groupthink situation within the bank itself. 
what has the RBA done during the crisis? Has this, you know, overly weighted focus on financial stability given way to more radical interest rate cuts and concerns about full employment? Well, I think the pandemic has uh, put paid to the stability concerns, uh, at least in terms of house prices and, and household leverage. Uh, so I think that's less of a concern for policy. The Reserve Bank has lowered its official cash rate to 0.25%, which the RBA views as the effective lower bound uh, because the RBA runs a, a corridor system. And so normally they'd have a symmetric quarter point corridor around that target cash rate. So if you've got a 0.25% cash rate, then the bottom of the corridor would be at zero. Uh, at the moment, they're running a slightly asymmetric corridor with a 0.1% floor, uh, which we can come back to uh, in a minute if you like. So they've lowered the uh, official cash rate. Um, they've never been a fan of negative interest rates. The governor has ruled out taking interest rates negative. Uh, to reinforce that 0.25% cash rate, they've offered some forward guidance, which is to say they expect that the cash rate will be held at that level for the next three years. So they're effectively trying to lower expectations for the future cash rate. Um, although I'd say that guidance is, doesn't differ substantially in practice from the guidance that we got from the bank before uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, the other thing it's done is to introduce a peg for the three-year bond yield uh, of 0.25%. Uh, so it's really tying down the uh, short end of the curve uh, out to three years um, at 0.25%. So it's actually a form of yield curve. Control. Right, yeah. Uh, and so the reason they're targeting the short end is because most retail and wholesale borrowing in Australia would effectively be priced off the short end of the curve. From the point of view of monetary policy transmission, I think the RBA views that as the part of the curve that they, they really need to nail down. Uh, it's, it's a loose peg. Uh, it's not a, a hard peg like the official cash rate, um, but they've been able to um, hold the three-year bond yield more or less at 0.25% since they uh, announced that policy. So the other element of what they've done is they've intervened uh, in the secondary market for government bonds, uh, basically buying bonds, partly with a view to hitting that three-year bond yield uh, target, but also with a view to smoothing out some of the liquidity issues that arose in the bond market uh, back in March. Uh, you, your previous guest, Daryl Duffy, I think very nicely described the sort of dislocations in the Treasury market that happened in March during the the peak of the concerns about the pandemic. Um, just as people were selling US Treasuries to raise cash, that happened in the Australian market as well. Um, so there's a big spike in Australian bond yields uh, right about mid-March. So the RBA was, even before it announced the, th the three-year bond yield peg, it was intervening in the secondary market to supply liquidity. So it's not really doing QE. I mean, it is intervening in the bond market uh, for liquidity purposes uh, and to hit that three-year bond yield uh, target. Um, but, of course, if this commitment were fully credible, then it wouldn't have to intervene at all. And, in fact, that's more or less the position the RBA finds itself in today. They, they haven't intervened in the bond market for the last few weeks. Um, and no one really wants to take on the RBA in that market. So uh, I think now they will be able to... Uh, maintain that three-year bond yield target without further intervention. Um, and this is, of course, what the RBA wants. They never really wanted to expand their balance sheet significantly in the way that the Fed did um, during the last or the current crisis. Um, they've never been comfortable with the idea, I think, of a, of a big balance sheet uh, expansion. So yield curve control gives them a way of uh, reinforcing the commitment on the cash rate uh, without having to do QE. Okay. Well, in the time we have left, I, I want to go back to a point you raised earlier, and that is there's been some discussion about the 
RBA changing its framework, its target. Now, the ones you suggested weren't very um, encouraging, lower, lower the inflation target or abandon it. But there's been some other talk as well, and I'm going to bring up, of course, my hobby horse, nominal GDP targeting. So there's a paper in 2018 by Warwick McGibbon and Augustus Panton. Um, it was a Brookings paper, but the paper's title was 25 Years of Inflation Targeting in Australia. Are there better alternatives for the next 25 years? And they go through and review some of this history we've talked about, and they come out in favor of a nominal income target. Now, this would have been just a few years after Governor Lowe has arrived, and I suspect he's probably not particularly interested in it. But is there a broader discussion in Australia for an alternative framework that includes some kind of makeup policy and maybe even nominal GDP level targeting? There's certainly a lot of support for nominal income targeting within the academic community. Um, there was an op-ed that was written by Warwick McKibben, uh, Richard Holden and John Quiggan that was published in the Australian Financial Review um, earlier this year which advocated moving to uh, nominal income targeting, uh, which was interesting in that I think those three authors would all come at it from slightly different perspectives, but nonetheless sort of land on the, the same conclusion. Uh, my concern here is I think, you know, Warwick uh, McKibben and his co-authors would probably argue for nominal income targeting on the basis that inflation targeting is broken. Um, and I don't think it's broken. I just think the central bank's not doing it, uh, or not, at least not doing it properly. So, I mean, I think you can still make inflation targeting work. Uh, one of the things you could do is use nominal GDP as, as an intermediate target or an indicator variable that tells you um, how to go about doing inflation targeting. Um, and I think this is a very good illustration of the way in which the RBA's uh, policy choice to undershoot the inflation target has in some ways discredited the existing inflation targeting regime um, and discredited monetary policy. So it's natural that people would then begin to look for alternatives. I mean, the other aspect of this is Warwick uh, McKibben and I think John Quiggan as well are both, have both been quite critical of uh, what they would see as an over-reliance on monetary policy. So Warwick at the end of last year, for example, was arguing against reductions in the official cash rate, arguing against QE. Uh, he was saying that if you uh, ease monetary policy, all this would do would increase household leverage and uh, increase uh, house prices, which is exactly what Governor Lowe would say. Um, so given their reluctance to use monetary policy instruments, it sort of begs the question, if you give the RBA a nominal income target, uh, but you don't have much conviction in monetary policy, well, how is it that the RBA is going to hit that target? Um, so are they arguing for a more fiscal policy-heavy approach to a nominal income target? You know, Warwick McKibben and, and John Quiggan, I think, would both be uh, or have been uh, very strongly in favour of relying more heavily on fiscal policy. Okay. Um, which I think is is unnecessary and uh, ineffective for a small open economy like Australia. Uh, I think monetary policy can do the job. Um, I think there are uh, attractions to nominal income targeting, not least I think it helps avoid some of the mistakes that have been made uh, through the inflation targeting regime. Yes, I think uh, one thing Australia does have going for it as well as Canada, Israel, all the countries that did relatively well during the Great Recession is their small open economy. So I think monetary policy is much more agile. It can make sharper turns. It can use the exchange rate channel more effectively. So I, I agree with you. I think monetary policy itself is still very effective if it's consciously chosen to be utilized. So you're right. You can pick any number of, of different targets. And if you're not using the tools at hand, it's, it's kind of a moot point. So let's hope that uh, the RBA will change course and embrace the other part of its mandate more readily, the price stability and full employment part of the mandate after the crisis, after things do calm down. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Stephen Kirshner. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an honor, David. 
Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.